myself. I'm a Swiss machinist here in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, this is my shop, and I'm going to make you a video about Swiss machining. This is our L12 Swiss lathe. We bought this at the end of uh, 2014. Um, this is the, the machine I'm going to talk about and discuss. Uh, here's our little RO4. It's a 4 millimeter Swiss lathe. Uh, kind of give you a quick tour of how this machine works. So uh, what we have here is uh, the, uh, the guide bushing area here. This machine doesn't have any ball screws, so you can move it when it's off, which is kind of cool. Um, this machine uses linear uh, motors by Fanuc to control all of its axis except for the subspindle. The subspindle has a ball screw. Um, the Z1, this is the, uh, the headstock of the machine here. You can see I can move this back and forth. And uh, the, you can see the bar stock. This is the, the main spindle collet here. This goes through a guide bushing. Guide bushing is uh, right there. <clears throat> the stock feeds through the guide bushing to see it popped out there um, feeds through the guide bushing and you have turning tools here two live tools that can work on the cross mill flats or drill cross holes um, this sleeve here is for drills you can you can drill on the main spindle and on the sub spindle at the same time and you have uh, two more stick tools in the back here for turning or grooving um, and then there's your subspindle collet. <clears throat> and this is a little device I made to uh, catch really, really small parts. Um, you'll see there's a coolant line running from the, from the coolant to the guide bushing over here. This is a special guide bushing called a Haybaker guide bushing. Uh, it uses uh, small carbide rollers instead of a, like a, a collet style guide bushing to um, keep the stock uh, from galling inside of a normal guide bushing, you have uh, it's like your 303 and your titanium, your 303 stainless and your titanium um, in a fixed. This, this machine came with a fixed guide bushing, and if you run uh, those two materials and, and others, but those two especially in a fixed guide bushing, uh, they tend to gall the guide bushing up, and uh, you need to do something a little different. So we have this hay bigger guide bushing in here. Um, so that's the RO4. It's got a fan of control on it. Um, it's fairly simplistic. Uh, we'll discuss controls on the L12 here in a minute. Uh, over here is our Citizen A20. This is the machine we started our business with. <clears throat> so the conf let me turn this this collector off. Um, this machine is a 20 millimeter Swiss machine. Um, it's got a configuration of uh, five turning tools on the gang, four live tools, and then four drilling tools, uh, four facing the guide bushing, and uh, an option of having four face the sub spindle. And then here we have, it's a little hard to see with the coolant lines in the way, but I'm not gonna move them because I have them just so. Um, there's four back working tools. So in this case, I have two drills, a countersink, and a, and a turning tool there to do some back turning. So there's a sub spindle on this machine. Um, it is basically a mirror image of the main spindle, so you can have uh, up to 20 millimeters there. Um, you have the option of passing the part through the sub spindle and having it come out the back if you have a really long part or you can eject it. This is the part catcher right here. The sub spindle comes over and you can eject it into the uh, parts catcher. <clears throat> um, so right now we're running 5.8 stock, which is uh, on the bigger side of what I normally do on this machine. I go up to three quarter normally, um, but 5.8 is um, what I have set up in the machine right now. 
Uh, you can see that high pressure coolant line is kind of bent and aimed at the cutoff tool. I have a high pressure line coming into the front, the, uh, front turn tool there. You can see the turn tool. Um, that has a high pressure in the um, in the turn tool itself. It's internal passageway in that tool and it comes out right at the tool tip. And then I have a, a Gen Swiss dog leg mooring bar holder in there. Um, basically gives me another front working position. So you'll probably see that mooring bar, but it's in there. It's a little AccuPro mooring bar. Um, and then I have a countersink, uh, or, or a chamfer mill I should say. A, uh, a ball mill, uh, a corner rounding end mill, and a uh, regular uh, 5 8 or uh, not 5 8 um, quarter inch, uh, a five flute end mill there. And we have just a couple drills. And you can see there's a there's a, a tool holder that works on both sides, the guide bushing and the main spindle, or the uh, sub spindle side. <clears throat> so in this machine, you can see um, sort of the axis label there. You can see the X1, which is how we denote the main spindle X in this machine. Uh, the X1 travels up and down here, and then the Y1 travels uh, negative and positive this way. Uh, so all these tools in the machine basically have an X and a Y axis in, 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 in addition to the Z. Um, so what that allows you to do is you can program all your live tools in terms of uh, Y and Z and X and Z um, or X and Y for that matter. If you have a, a, a live tool such as like a little air spindle you can put that in the main in the uh, drop down tool holder there and then you can program an, an end working uh, feature with an X and Y coordinate system. Um, or in terms of your live tools here on the cross, you usually would do like a Y and Z or um, an X and Z maybe. <clears throat> or just a y, y move to make a flat. And the sub spindle here, you have a, an X2 and Z2. Um, so the sub spindle is denoted as having uh, basically its own two axis lathe um, and then there's a sort of a special mode that I'll kind of explain on the L12 of, of how you get the two uh, control paths to talk to each other um, but basically the premise here is that you have uh, a Z a headstock Z here there's a headstock on this machine um, that's your Z1 you can see it's labeled here Z1 so that does all your Z moves for the main spindle. And then you have uh, your X and Y for the guide bushing side, your X2 and your Z2 for the sub spindle. So that's sort of like a five axis machine right there. It's obviously not five axis in the sense of, of milling, but it's there are five axes. Each uh, spindle has its own C axis. Um, the reason you need a C-axis on the back here is because you can actually bring your live tools over and orient your sub-spindle and do milling work with your sub-spindle. Uh, if you have a feature that's hard to get to over here, once it's in your sub-spindle, you can pull in and you can bring your live tools over and start doing a little bit of work with the part in your sub-spindle. Um, and then the sub-spindle <clears throat> uses these tools independently while the main spindle is making the, the front side of the part generally. You drill your back hole, you do a little back turning, you do an edge break, that kind of thing, and then you drop the part off. Um, so this is our workhorse machine. This machine has been busy for the last two years making the same two jobs. <clears throat> and then we have a, uh, a Haas mini mill, a super mini mill I should say, we have a Universal Robots, and it's kind of in a, in a parked position right now, but we have a Universal Robots uh, UR5 there. Um, on this machine, we do have the fourth axis, and we do have a, a chick vise uh, set up with some soft jaws. We got the tool sitter, we got the probe, we got the super large uh, 10 pool changer on this machine. Uh, so over here we have. Uh, 
our sort of our little inspection area that I use. Got some tool holders laying there. Um, and then here's my desk. Uh, so what we'll do here is we'll get the L12 fired up in the morning here. I guess, oh yeah. I had this machine auto power off, so it doesn't flip its own breaker like the other machines. So we boot it up. <clears throat> so this machine, uh, like I said, we bought it in 2014. It was pretty much new at the time. The, I mean, the, the, uh, the model of the machine was new. Uh, our, so uh, this is a control screen. Um, it's called preparation. On a Citizen you have uh, a few modes that are consistent across um, really all these machines. They have the, sort of the same three or four modes that you use. Uh, preparation, that's a mode you use to set up. It has all your data about your tool. Uh, for instance, your core, your diameter, your longitude, and the tool type. Um, these are all the tools on the front side of the machine. Um, and then you can go page down to tool 21 and tool 30s. Tool 30s are those back working tools that we, sh we saw. Um, so in this machine, it's the same setup as the A, almost exactly. I have uh, three or uh, four back working side tools here. Any of these can be live. I have two live holders in here right now. Um, and for another $2,000, you can add another one, and $2,000, you can add a fourth one. So we just have the ones that came with the machine for right now, because that's all we need. Um, these, are, these are independent of the main spindle. So the this is the back spindle here, but it's got the same X2 and Z2 axis set up. We have the, the guide bushing side tools. We have, on this machine, we have six uh, turning tools. I have two live tools here. These uh, live tool holders can can go over and go and plug into uh, this side of the machine as well. So I could take these out and have four live cross tools exactly like the A. Then I have four uh, drop down, we call that drop down uh, front working tools. And you can see I have this, this, happen, this machine happens to be set up in the same way that the A was. I have three of them facing the guide bushing, and then I have one where I'm, I'm doing a, a deeper operation, an ID deeper operation on the back spindle here. And uh, we have some chips hanging on there from earlier. I'll flip them off while we're in here. Okay, so it's probably a little hard to see. Let me get in here. That's a, a spot drill, a 22 and a half thousandths drill, a 14 and a half thousandths drill, and then a little chamfer tool. And we have a little quarter inch end mill and, a, and an eighth inch uh, 90 degree chamfer mill. And there's my cutoff tool, a back turn, which I never use, um, but it's in the machine for some reason. That's my front turn tool there. Uh, I have a, where's that at? A little grooving tool there. I have a threading tool kind of hiding in there, and then I have another front turn. It's actually set up from a job I ran like six months ago. And, I don't really use positions five and six there, so they get to stay in there and, and wait for me. Um, and then on the back we have a drill, a little boring bar. It's an eighth inch or a, like a 110 minimum diameter boring bar. Uh, a little drill, and a 78 thousandths drill, and a little uh, 60 degree chamfer tool on live holders. We use live holders here mainly because the other jobs that I run use live holders there. And since they're just little drills, we just throw them in a the collar and use them. Uh, you see some high pressure coolant lines on this machine. This machine has a 10 line setup. So I can have anywhere uh, up to 10 high pressure hoses coming through the machine and aimed at different tools. I set up a, a block here to have two lines on the back. Uh, and then I have four lines across here, one on the live tools and I have two there. I think I still have one or two that I could I could add in. Oops, sorry there. Um, and then your your main low pressure coolant comes through the through the machine there, and then I have some low pressure lines there as well. Um, 
so there is the high pressure pump. You can see all the all ten lines coming through there. This thing is is controlled uh, via B codes in the machine. Um, you have your your normal M and G codes like uh, most CNC equipment. Then you have a, a thing called a B code. It's just basically B one through ten. Every time you issue a B code, it just flips the the uh, the input on it. So if if it's on, it turns it off. If it's off, it turns it on. Which is a little annoying because you got to keep track of what you're doing. And if you lose track of when you turned it on or off, you need to go back through your program and figure it out. So this is a the bar loader for the machine. This is a Cav uh, Cav 12 up to 12 millimeters. Um, this is a special bar loader because it is jammed right now. I don't know why it's jammed. We'll have to fix that. Um, this bar loader is controlled uh, by the machine. Um, and what if, if I ran the bar loader back, which I could show you the bar loader collets, which I can show you one here. <clears throat> So these are my uh, guide bushing collet cases. Um, this is what an, a collet looks like. Uh, it looks sort of like a, like a little, little modified 5C collet, but it's, it's not a 5C. It's a, it's a, the designation is a TF, there it is, a TF-16. Um, the guide bushing looks similar, but it's got threads on the back of it and it's got a little hard to see. You can see carbide pads there. That keeps the, the stock from wearing away uh, the guide bushing. You can see this is a, uh, it's a quarter inch. It's an SD12R, 125R, sorry. <clears throat> and this is the bar loader collet. This goes in the bar loader and it grabs the bar end and feeds it into the machine and then at the end of the bar it pulls the remnant back out and, and drops it off at the end of the bar loader. So kind of the first thing about Swiss machines is you work from bars and the bar can't be fed all the way up so you get what's called a remnant. This is a, an average size remnant. Some are longer, some are shorter, but this would be average size. It's about, I don't know, about seven or eight inches. So that's the amount of bar we can't use. So every time we run a 12 foot bar, we get one of those. Um, that's why, and if you run a six foot bar, you get the same length. So that's why it pays you to run longer bars. Um, but I occasionally run a six, six foot bar. If it's easier to ship the material, then we just get six foot. So in this machine, this is our Z1 here, it's a headstock. You can see it travels, uh, this machine travels a little farther because you can take this, this is a, a, a belt that keeps the guide bushing turning at the same speed as the main spindle. But on this machine, you can take that off and run the main spindle all the way up and, and use it in what's called chucker mode. Um, so that's an option. Uh, this here is the collet closer assembly for the collet there's the collet cap right there. Um, oh, I can jog that back. So, so my Z1's not clamped, so the stock stays in the guide bushing, and I can jog the Z1 back. Kind of look in there. You can see the back end of the guide bushing. It's called the Drover. Uh, the drover is the nut that tightens on the guide bushing to pull it in. What you do is you run it so that you can just spin the stock and the guide bushing doesn't go along. 
or in other words, that there's there's some resistance there uh, against the the guide bushing that keeps it tight in that in that fit, which is what you need to support the work while you're turning. If you're turning longer pieces, um, this is the part that I'm making right now. It's a little little hub we call it. Um, like I said, it's got a 22 and a half thousandths hole in the front like a 14 thousandths hole that goes through it and then it there's like a big uh, big taper in the back and um, so that 14 and a half thousandths hole is only something like uh, 200 thousandths deep and then uh, the, the back hole comes in so that's it's kind of a perfect part for this machine it's got flats on it it's got a bunch of tools on both sides uh, turning and, and cut off and all that. Um, so yeah, we have on this machine, we have the X1 going up and down, the Y1 going left and right. The Z is over here, the Z goes in and out. And then the, the Z2 goes in and out and the X2 goes this way. So you can program on this machine, I don't have, uh, I have a little turn tool like I have on the other machine. I have it out for this job, but usually I face the back of my part off with a turn tool that's mounted here. Um, for this job, we just use the cutoff to, and we, we leave a nice finish with the cutoff. That's good enough. Uh, it's also why I have this high pressure line on my cutoff tool. It helps to uh, Im improve the finish. So I'll kind of walk through a program here. Let's see what's going on here. Um, this is a manual feed page. You can see uh, X, X1, Z1, Y1, X2, Z2, A7. A7 is basically the Z axis of the bar loader. And I can jog that bar loader independently of um, the machine Z1 axis. So I can move the bar in this position. I could move the bar in and out um, without moving the Z. Um, and then you actually turn the bar loader on here. Go back to prep. Prep is the page you do your setup on. Um, the core is uh, sort of like the the uh, the height of the tool in in like a in a traditional turning sense. If you're low or high on your cross slide. I guess that's the right term. <laughs> um, that if you have a little pip on the end of your part, uh, when you face it with a front turn tool, you would adjust your core over the width of that, or the diameter of that pip, and that would give you your core height. Sometimes that's how I set it. Sometimes you just slide the tool against the stock. Um, and that's sort of, that brings me to the, the MC data. The MC data, for this, uh, for citizens anyway, is basically what tells the machine how to make your part or, or what stock you have in the machine which kind of goes along with how to make your part. Um, so it's asking there, it's asking for the bar stock diameter. You put the bar stock diameter in and it's, it's essentially telling the machine when you go over here and set tools, um, use that as a reference instead of making a a test cut and telling the machine what diameter you cut you just tell the machine what bar stock you have in and it'll position the the tool post in the right spot to lay your slide your tools against um, so you just I'll do a, I'll do a setup video to kind of explain that better but it's it's almost like you're setting it against a, a gauge of uh, 0.3125 or 5 16 diameter um, and then the next the next thing there is called your tool position that's when you're waiting when you move this the machine into a weight position how far is the tool away from the bar stock um, you specify what tool you use for cutoff and then you give it some parameters for a cutoff cycle you tell it how how long the part is how many you're going to make before you open the collet to get a, a new length of stock in. And then you tell it um, the back spindle, if you have an extend nose chuck, which is a, an extend nose collet, I should say. Um, well, 
These were these are my extend nose collets for my A. I don't really use these a lot anymore. You can see it has a longer. There's a there's a standard collet and an extend nose. So you tell the machine if you're using an extend nose, and it will do a little bit of uh, calculations to make sure you have it set right. Then you tell the machine how far the workpiece is going to stick out of the back collet when you're done with the part cycle. And then you tell it, this is, this is uh, the length of the part plus your cutoff width. That tells the bar loader um, how many pieces per bar to calculate. And then these are just some uh, set up different holders that you can put in the machine and it would give you a different tool layout. Uh, but this is sort of the key to setting the machine up is entering this data. And then uh, to program so basically how, what a program looks like. And this is called a dual path control. So you have one program path here, one program path here. This is the main spindle or dollar one we call it in, on a citizen. Sorry, dollar one. Dollar two is the sub spindle. And then you have two programs that execute simultaneously. And what you can do is, this is called a sync, syncs displays. So you sync them, and then that aligns the program on all the special sync codes. G600 on a Citizen is a sync code, um, and there's a couple different modes that work together. For instance, this is G660, so you can see the controls lined up on G660. G660 is when you use uh, this tool here, and you can do it for any of them, but you use the front and the back tool at the same time. So it keeps the machine, it keeps that tool holder parked in front of the guide bushing and the sub spindle until both sides have finished using it. So we can scroll past G660, and then you can see there's a, a G600 that cancels that. So G600 there cancels that mode. And we scroll down, we're executing both of these programs at the same time. They aren't waiting for each other until we get to one of those special codes again. Uh, this side's doing some turning, this side's doing some boring. And then we get to this part. This stops the machine here uh, and turns on the live tools, uh, M80, S3, 4500. So we're turning on our live tools at 4500 RPM. And you can see we call tool eight uh, and E00. That that mean, that tells the machine when you move to tool eight, get the C-axis lined up on zero degrees so we can start milling. And then we do some milling work. You can see over here we're getting, we're ejecting the part. Now, just because the, the lines line up in this view, it doesn't mean that's what's executing at the same time, depending on how long each side takes to get its work done. And then we get down here, and we can see we have a bunch of blue lines here. So we have a bunch of lines that are synced up. Uh, exclamation point two L54, that's called a queuing code. We're getting ready to cut off the part and have the sub spindle catch it. So the first thing I do is get the spindles turning the same way, which is opposite for the sub spindle, but this, the main spindle's turning uh, normally. And the main, the uh, sub spindle turns backwards, and then we go into G650 mode. Right before that, we have a G814R00. That tells the main spindle and the sub spindle to orient themselves to each other, uh, so we can pick off on this part that has flats on it. So I use a round collet to pick that part off. Eh, round collet, even though it's mostly square. There's just a little bit of round left, and I use my round collet to pick off on that so I don't have to do anything special, um, which is nice. Um, and then we go into G650 mode here, which is uh, the subspindle sync mode. So we, we feed the, the Z2 in, or the subspindle into to that position on the part. Then we have a couple more queuing codes here. This is uh, spindle sync confirm. Make sure the spindles are turning the same speed and the same orientation. Close the collet. 
and uh, turn the air blow off. I'm not using the air blow in here. And then we we feed our X2 down or our X1 down to negative uh, 50 thousandths, which is a cutoff. And then we go back into G600. That has the effect of sub sending the subspindle home and starting a new part after it checks checks for end of bar and cancels the spindle sink. So we check at that point we check for end of bar, which is just a flag set by the bar loader to say I'm I'm past my position for a new bar, which means I have that remnant left. And then we uh, are done. We executed one program. So what I'll do is I'll I'll kind of. Uh, I'll, I'll cut to a, uh, a video of it making a part. It's a little hard to see with the coolant splashing around, but uh, I think it'll be where we'll stop with today. Okay, hey, thanks for watching, guys. Okay guys, so one thing I forgot to discuss was um, with this machine, you have live towing on the back. So how does that work with um, this, uh, the sub spindle? How do you do sort of like milling flats or, or doing uh, anything complicated? So this machine uses a, a mode called polar interpolation. Um, and the way you program this is you program the X and the C axis at the same time. And the machine, the spindle or the part, if this was an end mill, the part would sit about here. And to make it shape, it would move in and out in the X, depending on where it was in the C. And the mill would, would be spinning and you would move the part in and out or in the Z as well. And that way, and that would make your shape. So you can do flats, you can do engraving, you can do almost anything um, there are a little bit of limitations there but with the c-axis on the sub spindle you do have the ability to to mill flats or um, drill off center holes or whatever you want to do on this machine um, so this is this is what the code looks like for polar interpolation you have uh, you always have to call up your um, tool radius offset or, or compensation and you have to, um, you work in X and C, which sounds kind of weird, but the mode actually you program it as if C was a Y axis. So you can, you can draw up your, your sketch in CAD and use an X and a Y coordinate and you, you just call it a C. That's not degrees or anything like that. That's actually, a, I think that's a radius. These are all radius. That's the other thing I forgot to mention. Um, you can program the y-axis and the x-axis and, and do you know 3d milling and all that kind of stuff but everything on this side is in diameter 
like a normal lathe, even your y-axis. So your y-axis, um, if you want to mill on the side of a part, you need to program it and compensate for the actual diameter of the tool. So you add, for this case, this quarter inch, sorry, this quarter inch um, end mill. You'd add a quarter inch to whatever you were doing to offset it that way um, to mill. And then you would program, if you want a flat that's uh, 250 across, you'd do 250 for the, the width of the part plus 250 for the width of the tool and that would give you half inch and, and that's actually what you would program, a half inch to mill a quarter inch um, flat across a part. And then you'd, you'd do that and then you'd rotate it 180 degrees and run that tool path again and that would give you a, a width or a flat width of 250. Um, so that's the only kind of confusing thing. It's, it doesn't, there isn't a mode that makes it into a, like a three axis mill. Um, the programming is a little bit tricky uh, in that sense. But you're not, I, I don't normally do any 3D milling on this machine or any of my Swiss machines. It's usually milling flats or a cross hole or something that's relatively simple, a deburring pass, a chamfer pass, something that's usually linear or um, only moving in one axis at a time, normally. Now, you, you certainly can do more complicated things, but um, that's, that's my experience. So I thought I'd add that in here at the end. Thanks.